Mr. Buster Flips. 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 Welcome to this exploration of Keats' Ode on Indolence. Um, one of Keats' more accessible poems, uh, and at the same time uh, quite different from the others, uh, the other odes, the other big odes, in that the subject matter and the attitude seems very different. The speaker has a very different voice to some of the other poems. So the subject matter of the poem is, is really straightforward. Um, the speaker is leisurely relaxing uh, and is met by three figures. Um, there's the personified love and then ambition and finally poesy that walk through the room. He's at one point uh, deeply affected by these characters and feels they are urging him to take some sort of action but in the end he decides to go on with his, his own indolence and remain indolent and, and do nothing, Re just keep relaxing. So if we turn to the text itself, uh, the first stanza starts one morn, so it's not defined which day it's such, but we are early morning. Um, before me were three figures seen with bowed necks and joined hands side-faced. So I think just looking at those uh, adjectives we can straight away get a sense of, of their personality and their, their attitude I guess, uh, the bowing of the necks, the joining of the hands and the fact that they're in profile walking past him. They seem to be ignoring him, they seem to be reverent and respectful and they seem to be communally heading wherever they're heading. They go together. <clears throat> and one behind the other stepped serene in placid sandals and in white robes graced. The combination of the white robes and the open sandals, they're things that don't hide things, they're pure, they're non-aggressive, um, etc. Uh, the placid sandals, obviously, is, is a bit of a synesthetic experience, because, um, yes, well, we're kind of personifying them and making it into something synesthetic. We then get an image that's fairly familiar to us from his visit to the museum in a different poem. Um, they passed like figures on a marble urn. When shifted round to see the other side, they came again, as when the urn once more is shifted round. So they, <coughs> obviously go around the room and come back in again. Uh, the first scene shades return, and they were strange to me, as may be tied with vases to one deep in Phidian lore. The persona of Phidias uh, I don't think is important here. I think he's just a metonymy uh, representation of any Greek sculptor um, at the time. What's interesting is to note as well in the first answer is, is the transition of these characters. Um, so they start out as three figures and then they become shades uh, and they're strange to the speaker. So there's some sense of development of these characters, uh, but it's all kind of vague and non-specific. So while the first stanza is purely an um, observation or reaction, uh, without reaction, the second stanza does um, start to stir the, th the ideas, at least the thoughts of the speaker. Um, and he starts trying to pry out some answers here. How is it, Shadow, that I know ye not? He s seems to feel that there is some sense of familiarity, but he doesn't get it. He doesn't recognize them. How come? How came ye muffled in so hush a mask? Yet another synesthetic description. Um, was it a silent, deep, disguised plot to steal away and leave without a task my idle days? So the, the days that used to be idle and indolent are now... Um, no longer going to be with him because because uh, he's going to be engaged in other things. Ripe was the drowsy hour, and then we get the description of, of what he was doing with this drowsy hour. The blissful cloud of summer indolence benumbed my eyes. My pulse grew less and less. Pain had no sting, and pleasure's wreath was no flower. <clears throat> so there's that sense of um, he was so indolent that he was almost achieving the sublime. He was perfectly happy and almost, you know, it's a near dying experience the way he's describing it here. He's losing his pulse uh, and no sense of pain or pleasure uh, felt. And then we get that real strong sense of emotion with the exclamation in the, oh, why did ye not melt and leave my sense undaunted quite of all but nothingness. 
But the shadows are not done yet, because in the th third stanza, they come by a third time. Alas, wherefore my sleep had been embroidered with dim dreams, my soul had been a lawn <coughs> besprinkled o'er with flowers and stirring shades and baffled beams. Um, even the alliteration here sounds disruptive and uh, annoying, uh, building on that frustration that he's feeling. A um, lot of a lot of plosive sounds, B's and D's here, and then the the stirring shade that sibilance also is is quite disruptive to his rest. The morn was clouded, but no shower fell, though in her lids hung the sweet tears of May. <coughs> the open casement pressed a new leaved wine, letting the budding warmth and throstles lay o oh, shadows twas a time to bid farewell upon your skirt had fallen no tears of mine so he's quite relieved when these characters are finally leaving uh, and departing up through the window <coughs> so through this third stanza the characters are still undefined but as they're passing this third time it's un un unknown and nondescript but as they pass the third time they turn around uh, a third time passed they by, and passing turned, each one the face a moment wild to me, and then faded to follow them. I burned and ached for wings because I knew the three. So here it's a distinct shift, and now he definitely doesn't want to remain indolent anymore. Uh, he wants to engage and interact with them. The first was a fair maid and love her name. We uh, get the, I think the, the um, disruption here has increased through the fact that he's breaking the meter when he first recognises uh, the figure of the maid, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the, who the maid is, i.e. love, um, because he then inserts the was affair to break the meter, because he could easily have read the first a maid of, and love her name, would have been perfectly fine, but he chooses to add was a fair maid, making her, making the rhythm uh, the meter uh, be irregular. The second was ambition, pale of cheek and ever watchful with fatigued eye. The last, whom I love more, the more to blame, is heaped upon her maiden moss most unmeek. I knew to be my de demon poesy. So he manages to, to s withstand the tantalizing features of ambition, the pale cheek and the watchful eye, but he cannot resist um, his the, the maiden that's most attractive to a poet, of course, uh, the demon poesy herself. Um, and obviously, yeah, the, the fact that we use the word demon to connect with, with the maiden um, shows the strength of emotion that this character has over his, his personality, his self. If we then move on to stanza five, the characters are beginning to disappear. <clears throat> they faded, and forth, forsooth I wanted wings. Oh, folly! What is love, and where is it? And for that poor ambition, it springs from a man's little heart, short fever fit. For poesy, no, she has not a joy, at least for me, so sweet as drowsy noons, and evening steeped and honeyed in little indolence. Oh, for an age so sheltered from annoy that I may never know how changed the moons, or hear the voice of busy common sense. So this dance has more of a of a reaction emotively to emotionally to what he's just perceived. Um, he's a bit angry with himself for for going through this whole ir irrational wanting wings and flying away with them um, and rather trying to logically control himself. <clears throat> Uh, which is quite different, obviously, from, from the Keats that we know in later poems, where logic serves very little, uh, serves no part. And then he goes to as far as to say that even poesy, who is obviously really important and really powerful uh, on his, his emotional state, has no joy uh, for him, as does this, the drowsy noons of indolence, honeyed indolence even, the sweetness of it. And then the stanza concludes by a longing back to, away from common sense again, back to the sublime that he was achieving through his in, indolence uh, at the start of the poem. <clears throat> uh, when we move on to the last stanza, the spirits, the shades, have now been transformed to ghosts. 
So ye three ghosts, adieu. You cannot, you cannot race my head cool bedded in the flowery grass, for I would not be dieted with praise, a pet lamb in a sentimental farce. So I'm certainly not going to be affected by you. I'm just going to lie here. My head is going to be cool bedded in the flowery grass. It's going to stay right where it is. Um, fade softly from my eyes and be once more in mask-like figures of a dreamy urn. Farewell. I yet have visions for the night, and for the day faint visions there is store. Vanish, ye phantoms, from my, <clears throat> from my idle sprite into the clouds, and never more return. So the feeling here is that at the moment the temptation of these uh, characters is, is leaving him, but he's certainly not um, done with them. It feels as if they're likely to return to tease him later on. Um, but at the moment, he does not want to have anything to do with these phantoms. So if we look at the poem holistically, um, it's it's quite a tight poem in terms of structure. Uh, we've got six ten-line stanzas, all in iambic pentameter, uh, apart from that one line in stanza four where he breaks it uh, to show the impact of the face uh, of the first spirit. Um, the rhyme scheme, as you can see, is fairly regular, but there are some slight breaks uh, in the lines um, but really we're dealing with um, a desire to remain in the immutable state to escape from any anguish any mortality anything that comes with being human he really just wants to preserve his own indolent state of pure relaxation